So today I want to talk about how computers and video games handle graphics. How they make the things that you see on the screen. And what I've done here is I've went to this website I found, uh, notian.net slash lightbright, L-I-T-E-B-R-I-T-E, which simulates the old school lightbright toy. And if you ever played with a lightbright toy, what it is is just a, a basically a box that had a light in it and you'd put a black sheet of paper over the light so you, you know you couldn't see the light and it had all these holes um, and these plastic pieces that had different colors and as you'd you'd put a plastic piece and you'd poke it through the hole which would break the piece of um, paper black paper behind it and um, then the light would shine through your little plastic thing and light up that color and you were able to, to, to draw by placing these little things. And that's very much like how computer systems work. Um, when you have a computer, you have a um, display, and that display has a resolution. Um, for example, if you click on display settings on your computer, if you're, say you're using Windows, um, advanced display settings here, you can change the resolution, right? And I'm not going to actually do that. I'm just going to close this down. What that does is it sets the, uh, a, num a grid, basically, of slots across and slots down. And those slots are called pixels. Um, and just like in the old light bright thing, each pixel can be on with a color or off. Yeah, and you can actually just think of each pixel as being on, right? And if it's off, it just has a value, I don't know, of black, like zero. And each of these pixels has a color value. So again, it might be off, it might be uh, black, it would be zero. Uh, maybe one would be blue, a value of two might be red, a value of three might be orange, who knows. Um, but each value, each pixel, has a some number of combinations that can define its color. That's called um, the color depth. So if you ever hear something has 8-bit color depth, that means for every pixel, it can be one of um, 256 different colors, because in 8 bits you can represent 256 different combinations. Um, and the way that most computers handle this is what they have is a, what's called a frame buffer. And a frame buffer is just a bunch of memory, and each memory location or um, let's just assume it like 8-bit memory and 8-bit memory, 8-bit uh, words in your in your memory. Each memory location corresponds to a pixel. So let's say your frame buffer starts at address zero. Um, this pixel here might be zero, and if it's turned off or if it's black, its value at address zero is zero. This pixel might be address one, and if uh, it was black, the value at one would be zero. But let's say I want to turn it on to blue. I might put a put a one in there. This pixel here, maybe I'll put a one in there too. So so address we have address zero, address one, address two. You know these guys are turned on. They would have each a one in their in their in their um, RAM, their frame buffer RAM location. This next one, address three. Let's say we had put a um, uh, let's say we put this color in there, green. And that might be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, maybe color value 7. And, and this is exactly what's happening. When your computer wants to draw something, it has to figure out, it, it kind of makes a grid. Um, well, the, the software that's drawing the picture figures out you know, the, the grid and what grid locations it wants to light up and what colors to make the picture that it's trying to draw. right? So if it's trying to draw like a little um, whatever this is called, parallelogram, I think, um, it might light up these various memory locations, memory 1, 2, 3, 4, um, not 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever, whatever this memory location is, and then this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. Um, if it wanted to draw a B, it might do something like this. So the computer has to um, figure out a grid and how that will, will, will appear to the user and then turn on the, the, the so that is, they have, it has to write specific values, color values, into the different memory locations to turn those those lights on. Okay. And 
old computers up until probably the n late 90s, they literally did this old video games so would have to figure out what the screen would look like and, and turn on each location as something would move across the screen. It would have to turn on pixels and then turn them off as, you know, as a little character moves across the screen um, to give you that, that sense of animation. Um, and that's a very expensive process because each of these, turning something on is actually a RAM write. It's an update. So if I wanted to, let's say, move this, this actually, let's, let's go back to here. Let's say I just wanted to animate a dot going across the screen. Well, the first thing I have to do is color everything to the background color. Let's say that's black. So if I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32 um, dots across. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I have 32 by 18. I have 576 um, memory addresses that would represent all the pixels on this screen. And, and again, old school video games or computer systems were, were a lot more. I think they were generally like 320 by 420. A lot of the, the um, like the, the IBM, um, early IBMs, like the VGA display and all that. I think that was like 320 by 240. Um, but that's 70, is that right? 320 times 264,000. 60, oh, that's a lot of memory locations. Um, but let's go back to our example of 32 times 18. Let's say my display was only uh, 32 pixels across and 18 pixels deep. Um, that makes a grid of 576 different RAM locations. And let's say for each pixel location, it was uh, there's 8-bit color. So that's exactly 876 bytes of memory that I require. So again, we're going to start out here at 0, um, and then we'll go across, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we go down, you know, we'll go, we'll count across, then down, and, you know, so forth and so on. So if I wanted to display this, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have to write 560, I'm sorry, 576 RAM locations starting at zero, then one, then two, then three, and I'm set the color to black, right? So already, just to clear the screen, I have to do 576 operations. Then, if I wanted to draw a box, let's say just a four pixel box, um, we'll just start it up here. We'll just start up here at zero, one, two, three. We'll do these guys, right? So RAM location three, four, this would be 32, 33, 34, 35, and 36. We're going to turn on, right? Well, now I have to set, I have to do four more RAM writes just to draw those four little pixels. And let's say I wanted this box is moving across the screen. Now, if I wanted to move it, I'm going to have to do two, two writes here to set the color back to black, and then two more writes to animate it moving to the right a little bit, right? And I'm going to have to constantly do this. This is extremely. Um, and especially, you know, your, your, your images are going to be much more than four pixels, right? This is an extremely expensive operation. You're going to spend a, almost all your CPU time, at least the old, old school computers like the Z80s and the um, 6502s, just, dis, just updating your, your frame buffer. So um, that's how the frame buffer works. Now, modern video games, or not modern video games, I'm sorry, um, if you had a Commodore 64 or an Apple IIe or an Atari, that might be exactly what's happening, right? Um, that might be exactly what's happening when you play a video game. Um, when it needs to draw a little person or whatever, it needs to clear the screen, then draw the icons. All right, a little smiley face here. It has to do a whole bunch of writes just to give you this, uh, uh, the images on your screen, RAM writes, and then when you move it, it's got to be constantly writing. And that, that takes a lot of effort. Um, 
so that's not how the old video game systems actually did it. And that's not how consoles did it. They were optimized. They had what's called sprites and tiles. And the sprites and tiles would kind of ease the burden from the CPU. And what it, the, the, the systems would generally have dedicated hardware that would offload a lot of this work for it. And making the, the CPU's job much easier. I've always wondered when I was in, younger why, like, you know, I had an Apple IIe, and it had a 6502 processor. Um, and, you know, the, the, the arcade games were so much more amazing. I mean, I love my Apple IIe, don't get me wrong. But the graphics were so much more amazing on the, the, the actual arcade games. And I never could understand why that was. Uh, until because I was very young back then, I didn't understand how all this worked. But um, a lot of the old arcade games, like Centipede, one of my favorite games, Crystal Castles, um, Millipede, they used the exact same processor as the Apple IIe, the 6502. And, you know, so I was always like, why the exact same processor? Why are the arcade games so much better? And the answer is, um, kind of like 3D cards for modern computers make a huge difference because they're actually handling all the processing. The old arcade games had dedicated hardware to specifically handle drawing things to the screen and updating it very efficiently. So while your Apple IIe might have used a frame buffer like this and actually had to individually um, turn on all the different pixels and turn them off, the arcade games and the consoles of the time, they kind of cheated. They had um, help. And in my next lesson, we're going to talk about how that, that actually worked. So join me for part two when I talk about sprites and tiles and, and how the CPU, the game board, or the CPU code and the processor would actually update and, and draw things to the screen uh, much more efficiently using the hardware sprites and tiles.